All right, it looks like we're ready to get started. We are um, broadcasting live now on Google Hangouts on Air. My name is Dr. Royce Kimmins. I am a professor at the University of Idaho, an assistant professor at the University of Idaho, and the director of the Doceo Center for Innovation and Learning here at the University of Idaho. I'm excited to welcome you to this course. Uh, we're broadcasting this live now. Um, participants in the course are welcome to watch it live, watch the broadcast live, or to watch it recorded at a later time. The benefit, obviously, to watching it live is that you can ask questions. 
Um, just like to begin by welcoming you to the course. I'm very excited to be teaching this course and sharing this experience with you all. Um, my goals for this course are, are twofold. First, I want to use this course as a method for introducing K-12 educators to issues surrounding open education. And second, I want to help foster dialogue and connections between K-12 educators and others, answering questions, sharing resources, and so forth. So I am very excited about this course as an opportunity to connect educators together and to involve um, as many people as possible in the dialogue of using open resources for K-12 education. Uh, we're using Google Hangouts on air for this. This is the first course that I've ever done this way. So uh, we'll see how it works. Um, so far, I think I have things figured out. Uh, we're broadcasting right now. I'll be able to edit this uh, video later on and cut out the beginning piece where I obviously didn't know what I was doing and post this to YouTube. So it should be available on YouTube uh, shortly after the session today. I'm still learning, still figuring this out. So um, if you have any feedback or uh, instructions, that'd be very uh, appreciated to give me some guidance. Um, all this will be recorded, so if you are taking the course and you miss a live event, um, you will still be able to, to watch the recorded session later on. Enrollment in this course is still open, um, so please invite colleagues in your school or district to participate, and I'll, I'll mention that again at the end, uh, but they can find information on enrolling on the course website. Uh, again, enrollment in the course is free. Anyone can take the course and receive a badge for completion. If you'd like professional development credit and are an Idaho educator, you can also sign up for a reduced cost professional development credit from the University of Idaho. During this session, uh, you're welcome to ask questions. You have the ability in your display to ask questions there. Um, and so feel free to ask them, but just recognize that there is a bit of a delay um, I have a, there's a little bit of time before um, I say something and you hear it. So what you're asking questions on will probably be what I was talking about a minute or two ago. So just be aware of that. So if you ask questions, um, please, please do ask questions, but just be aware it might take me a few minutes to get to them. I won't be stopping uh, right away uh, at any points in the, in the session to ask for questions. Rather, if you ask questions, I'll just let them build up and I have some, some times built into the session where I will stop and answer any questions that have come through. My goals for today's session are pretty straightforward. I want to introduce you to the course. I want to make sure that you understand how the course works. I want to give you a brief introduction to open education and what we'll be covering in the course in terms of content, and I want to answer any questions that you may have. Um, so, to begin, I'm going to share my screen with you and we're gonna walk through the course website a little bit. I've worked really hard to try to make this as user-friendly as possible, make it as clear as possible. So I'm gonna to switch to screen share here. Okay. So you should be seeing the course website now. The course website, um, as a simple layout, so it has a, a column on the left that's na the navigation bar and all the column content is on the right. In the overview page, you'll see a course trailer and also some brief details about the course, reminding you that this is a free course. If you ever have any questions, feel free to contact me. You'll find my email address here along with my Twitter handle, so you can contact me on Twitter. You can also use the course hashtag to uh, talk about course specific topics on Twitter. And we also have a course community on Google Plus that you are welcome to join. You'll notice that the course dates, um, the course starts on, on October 6th and it ends November 15th. This is a six week spread, um, but you are not required to complete all of your assignments by the 15th. Uh, rather you have until December 10th, which is noted down here. Uh, the crediting institution is the University of Idaho the College of Education. This is worth one credit if you are taking it for credit, if you pay the enrollment fee, and this is graded on a pass-fail basis. Um, if you would like to sign up for the course and you haven't already, feel free to click the Sign Up Now button. This is how I will be uh, contacting you, sending you emails and updates. Also, you can click Use This Form if you want to apply for the professional development credit. Um, using this course, I have some, some 
basic information here about how you might want to use this course for your own professional purposes or in your district or school. Um, so feel free to peruse those. Um, the course is simple, pass, fail. If you complete all the course assignments, you pass. If you fail to complete all the course assignments or you do not participate in the live events or watch them, uh, you will not be able to pass the course. The really exciting thing about this course, I believe, are the guest sessions, which we will be hosting. Um, throughout the course of the, the six-week period, we will have four guest speakers. And these guest speakers may be found on the course calendar. You'll see we're welcoming Jim Groom, who is a leader in um, open education at the university level. He has spoken, uh, given TED Talks, spoken in various venues about this, been a keynote speaker at the Open Education Conference. So we're very excited to have him to answer questions about digital citizenship and what does it mean to be an open educator. The second guest speaker will be Georgia Harper. She works for the University of Texas Library System, where she uh, does a lot of work with uh, intellectual property. She understands issues of copyright very well. And so we'll have her help us understand some of the things that we're struggling with with regards to copyright, fair use, and so forth. Our third guest speaker is George Villachanos. He is an assistant professor. I'm sorry, I failed to mention Jim Groom is is an assistant professor at University of Mary Washington. Uh, George Velichanos is, is, a, is a professor at Royal Roads University in Vancouver. He is a Canada Research Chair for Emergent Technologies. He's written on issues of openness and uh, published a, a book on emergent technologies and a number of journal articles related to these topics. And he'll help us to understand some of the challenges of openness. And then our final guest speaker will be Scott Cook, who is the State of Idaho uh, Director of um, Curriculum Adoption, and he will help us understand how open educational resources and curricular review fit into the state level. So that's really exciting. I'm excited to talk with each of these people that have some of your questions answered. Um, in addition to the guest speakers, you also notice that we have Social media is built throughout this course, so you're welcome to use Twitter uh, to communicate with me or to share resources about the course along with Google+. We also have a back channel here that you can use as, cha as a chat room, both during live sessions and between sessions. And just to follow up, I mentioned before that December 10th will be the last day submit to submit all of your assignments. Um, please don't wait until then. Procrastination is never a good thing. Uh, you can turn in assignments as early as, as you would like. You are, um, there is no penalty for turning them in early. You're welcome to go through the entire course uh, right now and, and work at your own pace. You'll notice that the course is broken up into modules. Over here on the left side, you'll see module number one, course introduction, number two, the ethic of open, and so forth. Each module is accompanied with a suggested completion date. So if you click on the calendar, you will see a suggested completion date in the left column, and you'll see the name of the event or the module in the right column. So for instance, course introduction, which we're going over today, uh, you would be expected to complete by October 8th, and then you would jump into, so this, is, this would be uh, module one. So you want to complete module one by, the, by October 8th, and then you jump into module two. Um, we are using the live events feature right now. So if you click over on live events on the left side, whenever we have a live event going on, whether it's a guest speaker or it's a lecture, you can come here and click on the link and it will take you to the live event. Uh, I apologize, there was some confusion this first time as I started a live event and then I actually accidentally deleted it. So I had to replace this link. So if you're struggling to get to this um, or if that ever happens again, the way to get to the current live event is to come to this web page and click on live event. Also, there are assignments associated with this course. Assignments are embedded in the modules. If you click on a specific module, you'll, you may see an assignment attached to it. So for instance, module 10, you scroll down, there's a share assignment. And to complete this assignment, you would fill out this form and submit it. And that would constitute a submission of your assignment. There are a number of assignments, and assignments include everything from 
um, reflecting on, on your own experiences to uh, having a forum conversation with other people in the course to submitting resources. So again, if you ever have uh, questions or concerns, feel free to contact me directly. My, my information may be found on the course details section of the main page. You also have a forum that is available to you. Um, for instance, on module five, you have a link to the online forum and this is used to submit questions if you have questions for the group. Now, speaking of that, I'm very excited to teach this course because of the wealth of experience and expertise that people are bringing as they come into to this experience with them. So I'm going to click on this participant demographics link on the left side to show you an overview of the people that have signed up for this course. Um, you will see in this map a list of all of the participants who are um, either students in this course or who are presenting in this course. So you'll see that um, we do have a lot of people in the state of Idaho. Idaho is broken into, up into three major geographic regions. You have the north, the southeast, and the southwest. And we have representatives from all three geographic regions. We also have people from outside of Idaho participating. We have a participant from uh, Canada, or a couple from Canada, a participant from Arizona, and a participant participant from Indiana. This is really exciting to me because this means that we can get a variety of people's perspectives in the forum to respond to one another and to share information with one another. So we don't just have a North Idaho perspective or even just an Idaho perspective, but we get to see how open education impacts um, teachers all over. You'll also notice that guest speakers come from all over. So again, George Villachanos is coming from Canada. We have Jim Groom coming from Virginia and Georgia Harper coming from Texas. Now, in addition to diverse geographic regions, our participants also reflect diverse uh, knowledge demographics. So people coming to this course may have different levels of understanding of copyright, different levels of understanding of open education and some uh, creative commons and some of the other issues or concepts surrounding open education. Here you'll see a, a chart of some of these demographics. So when people sign up for the course, I ask them to self-assess, <clears throat> excuse me, on these different areas. And you'll see, for instance, open education, uh, the majority of people rated themselves fairly low, a two or lower on open education, but we still have quite a few that rate themselves very high. And what is, why is that? Why would someone rating themselves high sign up for the course? Well, I think that speaks to the beauty of open education is that you don't just have a single instructor working with, your, with the students, but open education by teaching in an open space allows us to bring um, educators in from all over who have a variety of experiences and allows us to bring in new experts and to interact with our class. On these other items, you'll, I think there's some interesting things to point out. Notice that copyright, fair use, and public domain are all fairly similar in the sense that most people feel like they have a pretty good grasp of copyright fair use and public domain. Very few people will say that they understand it perfectly, but, uh, but most people feel fairly confident. And I think we'll talk about this a little bit more. But these are terms that we use fairly often. And I fear that oftentimes as educators, we may not fully understand what they mean. Um, also, you'll notice copyleft is the very, probably the only item in this uh, chart that, that has a direct negative linear uh, progression in the sense that most people have never heard of it or don't know anything about it, and very, very few know it extremely well. Creative Commons, though it's somewhat similar to copyleft, um, is slightly different. We have probably the average of folks um, feeling somewhat confident about it, at least they've heard about it. Um, but you know, very few feeling that they are very extremely confident. So I'm excited to have such diverse group here uh, so that we can learn from one another. And I think that through this process, I can learn and each of us can learn uh, in all of these different categories. So our learning goals really fall into these six categories. We each want to learn more about open education. 
We each want to learn more about copyright and so forth. And so I think that as we have conversations, as we share resources, we can all improve our understanding of all six of these concepts. Now, I'd like to jump in and start talking a little bit about um, I'd like to start talking a little bit about why I'm interested in teaching this, why even talk about open education? What, what is the purpose and what is open education for those of us who uh, may not have had much exposure to it? So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna put some slides up. I'm gonna talk through some of the concepts that are central to open education. One moment. Okay. So open education really emerged as a field following um, a movement to put, to create open textbooks. Um, there was a group of folks and university professors predominantly who decided that there is a real need to think through how we can use open content to address some of the some of the access issues and some of the needs that we're seeing in higher education related to access to content, um, and this really came about because of rising costs of educational resources. If you look at this graph, you'll see that yes, tuition costs have gone up significantly significantly over the past decade or two, and we hear about that in the news all the time. But what we don't hear about as much is that educational books and supplies have gone up at an extremely, um, um, at, just as, at an insane rate. If we look at uh, cost today versus cost 10 years ago, there's really no comparison. And what this means is that educational publishers are just making a killing on, on in this market. And it's really putting a stress on students, putting a stress on schools who see budgets, budget constraints uh, to provide quality educational resources to students at a, a cost that was uh, similar to what they had in the past. And I think when we look at this, we begin to realize that we are wasting a lot of money, um, especially in today's age when we have so much access to information, so much access to technology, and so much of the information is ubiquitous. We, um, we struggle to use this information in a way that is really cost effective. And I think that open education can help us to address some of these issues and help us to be more cost effective in how we use technology, how we use resources in our schools. Uh, that having been said, I think everyone, anyone that uses the internet has benefited from open education already and by this free sharing of information. So if you think about some of the most trafficked websites on, on the web. Um, you know, Wikipedia is, is a great example of that. Um, Wikipedia is a community encyclopedia created by uh, thousands and thousands of people collaborating together without any pay, without any uh, motivation other than that they want to share. And what Wikipedia has become is a great resource. I think in schools, Wikipedia has often got a bad rap, especially when it was first getting started, uh, probably for some legitimate reasons. But as we've seen Wikipedia grow and evolve, the Wikipedia of today is very different from the Wikipedia five years ago. And to the point that they've done studies on Wikipedia and the content of Wikipedia, and they've come to recognize that uh, the content of Wikipedia is actually fairly good, at least in the um, the articles that are really well trafficked, where a lot of people are contributing to them, the, the articles themselves end up being pretty good. Uh, one study that they did in Nature magazine was they compared um, a group of Wikipedia articles with a group of Encyclopedia Britannica articles to see um, if Wikipedia was significant, significantly more flawed than Encyclopedia Britannica. And what they found was that um, the two were equally flawed. So neither one was perfect, but reading Wikipedia in the case of those articles was just as accurate as reading, reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. So I think that speaks a lot to kind of where we are as a society now, where we are um, as consumers of, of the internet, that we have so many resources available to us for free. But the big question is, what is the value of those resources and how do we use them? 
I believe that many of us, if we saw this picture, would recognize many of this, the, the people in this picture. These are Disney princesses. And I have three daughters, so I get to see princesses on the, on the screen a lot. Um, if you look at this, I think that, again, many of us could name almost all of these princesses. So I actually can, I'm ashamed to say. Um, but so we have Jasmine, Mulan, Snow White, Cinderella, Aurora, uh, Ariel, the Little Mermaid, and Belle. Now, with each of these, I think it's really interesting. I think we'd all recognize that these, are, that these are Disney characters. But where did Disney get the idea for these characters? Did Disney create any of these characters from scratch? Or which ones did Disney cre create from scratch? And when I ask groups of teachers that, I think most of them recognize that, yes, some of these are borrowed from folk tales and things like that. But in large part, we know these characters because of Disney. Well, the answer is that all of these characters existed prior to Disney. All of these characters come from um, things that were written hundreds of years ago, uh, for instance, Grimm's Fairy Tales or Arabian Nights or, or other um, local stories. And what Disney has done well is they've taken these stories that were created by someone else and they have adapted them for their purposes. And for that reason, um, let's look at Cinderella here in the center. Is Cinderella subject to copyright? Well, Disney Cinderella is copyrighted, obviously. Their movies that they make about Cinderella are copyrighted. Uh, any uh, merchandise they create with Cinderella on them are, are copyrighted. But the actual character of Cinderella, the actual story of Cinderella is not copyrighted by Disney. And that means that people can use it. So for instance, if you start a band, you can name your band Cinderella or, or write a song and name it Cinderella. Or if you wanted to make your own story of Cinderella, you could do that. You can make your own musical of Cinderella without having to pay royalties to, to Disney. Now, how is that possible? Because Disney created Cinderella and they are enforcing copyright on, on their version of Cinderella. So kind of how does that work? And that's one of the questions we're going to ask in this course. Contrast that with Harry Potter and, and you'll see the issue. So Harry Potter was written much more recently than the original Cinderella. Could someone take the story of Harry Potter and write a sequel? Could someone else take the story of Harry Potter and make a movie about Harry Potter without J.K. Rowling, the author's permission? Uh, the answer to that is no, because J.K. Rowling uh, owns the uh, usage rights of Harry Potter. She has copyright on it. So she gets to control how it is used and when it is used. So all this leads to copyright. And I think that educators um, have a general misunderstanding of copyright. Anecdotally, I've noticed that many times educators either will um, think that copyright doesn't matter and completely ignore it, or they will think that copyright is this boogeyman that they don't want to mess with and it leads them to act in fear and it prevents them from using resources for educational purposes that they would like to. And so I think in this course, we need to first clearly understand what is copyright, but also understand what other, um, what are the limitations to copyright and how can we work around copyright and use uh, works that are copyrighted, but also works that are not copyrighted and released under copyleft and Creative Commons licenses for educational purposes. All this comes to a head because of the web. Um, people have talked about copyright for a long time and copyright laws have changed over time in response to culture, in response to um, needs of society and the technology of the time. But the internet is really interesting because it forces us to rethink lots of issues of copyright um, right away. Um, so if you think about how easy the internet makes it for us to share information, information in a variety of formats, whether it's text in the form of books or encyclopedias, or it's video, or it's music, or it's software, we can share information much more quickly than we ever could before, and we can share it in a way that is non-destructive. So if I write a book, I can share a digital copy of that book with, with you without giving away my digital copy. And I think that's really exciting, but it also creates a problem for people that have traditionally uh, made money or made a living off of copyrighted works. So again, in this course, our goal is to understand what, what is copyright, how to use copyright, 
but also how is it changing in response to the internet? Uh, copyright law has been brought up a few times recently. One of the biggest um, times it was brought up was back in 2011 when some Senate uh, members uh, of the United States Senate brought forth a bill to um, um, potentially restrict the free flow of information on the internet. Now, depending on who you ask, that statement would be phrased differently. So some would say it's to re it, was re it would restrict the free flow of information. Others would say it would protect copyright owners and prevent piracy and those kinds of things. Now, in response to that, um, those bills were called SOPA and PIPA. In response to that, Wikipedia decided to have a blackout day. They decided to turn off all of Wikipedia for 24 hours to help raise awareness for this issue. Um, so anyone that tried to go to Wikipedia to try to access an article would just see this page that you see now. And it got a lot of people worried. It got a lot of people thinking, well, what would happen if Congress had the ability to, to determine um, what could be shared and how, how it could be shared? And as a result, that, uh, that bill was struck down. It's still, well, it wasn't struck down, but it didn't go through. And it's uh, still awaiting consensus. But I think this is important for us to recognize because there are huge lobbying organizations and, and you know, frankly, just interested people that want to be sure that we can maintain uh, intellectual property in an age of the internet. But at the same time, the conflict with that is that we still want to support the free flow of information. Now today we have, we live in a really exciting time where we have more information than we know what to do with. We have so much information that there's no way anyone could possibly go through all of it in their lifetime. And so as, excuse me, as educators, it behoves us to think about what is our role now in this world where information is so accessible and so free and so available and how are we both to use it in our in our professional lives, but also how are we to teach our students to use it? Um, so much more, it seems like the role that educator is becoming, um, is that the educator has to become a, a guide to help students to learn how to navigate information resources rather than being the source of that information, which was used, may have used to be the case. This leads us to copyleft and to public domain. This is a public domain symbol. So we'll talk about public domain later in the course, but not everything is copyrighted. There are things that we can use. There are things that um, whose copyright expires or that are just not placed under copyright or that the author uh, willingly decides not to place under copyright. And in those cases, educators or anyone else for that matter may use those resources for any purpose. For instance, many of the um, great classics that we use in education are in the public domain. So if you think about anything written by Jane Austen, so Pride and Prejudice, or The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, both of those books were written so long ago that they are no longer under copyright protection. That means that you could use them in your course without, um, you could create digital copies and distribute them to your students without paying royalties on those digital copies. It also means that a Hollywood company could take them and make a movie about them without paying any royalties to Jane Austen or her estate or H.G. Wells or his estate, which they have. So recently, there was a Pride and Prejudice movie that came out and a War of the Worlds movie, both within the last decade or so. Um, in each case, those companies that produced those movies and, and created those movies did not have to pay for uh, copyright, um, the copyright to do that. Um, now, it's not just print media, though, that is in the public domain. As time goes on, other forms of media are being placed in the public domain as well because their copyright has expired. One example that I found online is jo this John Wayne movie, McClintock. Um, I remember watching this movie as a kid, watching it on VHS. Now this movie has been around so long that apparently the copyright has expired on it. So that means that anyone could take this movie, they could redistribute it, make copies of it, and share it. Um, I think the really interesting thing about this, though, is that the movie McClintock was not an original creation in the sense that the story was not a completely original story. So you see this little tagline here. It says, he tamed the West, but could he tame her heart? This 
this movie was based on The Taming of the Shrew by William Shakespeare. So what the creators of this movie did was they took a story by William Shakespeare that was no longer under copyright and they made a movie about it and they released that movie and made money on it. But now the time has come that even that product as well has passed out of copyright because enough time has gone by. And so we'll talk more later about when something passes out of copyright and how we can know when it is in the public domain. Now all that having been said, some things are not susceptible to copyright. So though a created work may be, may be placed under copyright like a book or a movie or a, or a recording of a song, um, concepts and facts cannot be copyrighted. So for instance, though I might make a, a star chart or a, um, an illustration of the planet Jupiter, that can be copyrighted. But the, the fact that Jupiter is a planet cannot be copyrighted. The fact that in our solar system we have X number of planets cannot be copyrighted. Um, and it's a good thing that they can't be copyrighted because otherwise every time we said that Jupiter was a planet we'd have to pay royalties to somebody. In addition to that, um, other things can't be copyrighted as well, like mathematical equations. We don't have to pay Newton, Newton or Einstein royalties every time we use one of their equations. Um, now, as we get to the web, though, a lot of people start to get confused. So, for instance, I'll often ask teachers, are blogs copyrighted? And many of them struggle to answer that question. Um, are blogs copyrighted? The answer is yes. They are a creative work that is created by someone. Um, now, the author of that blog can choose to do certain things with it so they can release it under um, certain copyleft or Creative Commons licenses, um, but by default, blog posts are copyrighted. Now, the problem with that is that blog posts are not created to be controlled necessarily. Uh, someone who, who writes a blog post doesn't do so with the intent of restricting who has access to that blog. Rather, they write a blog post so that they can share it. They share it with the world and they want everyone to access it. They don't want anyone to have to pay royalties to, to go read their work. They want to share their work publicly. So this creates a new culture on the web where we start to consider you know, what are the limits of copyright law or how do we need to rethink copyright in a new age when we are more freely able to share information and want to share information online. Um, in addition, we see a huge culture on the web moving toward the use of memes. I'm sure everyone's probably, and if you're on Facebook, you've probably seen this picture, but probably with a hundred different uh, text lines on it. Um, a picture is a copyrighted work. So if someone takes a picture of their child and they place it online, they are the owner of that work. Um, so if you take it and you remix it, you put your own text on it, um, is that a violation of copyright? Technically it is. This has actually come up recently in a few lawsuits because um, uh, marketing agencies have recognized the power of these memes, of these images that everyone recognizes, and they've gone and used them in some of their advertisements. Um, as they have done that, the owners have turned around and said, you do not have our permission to do that, and they've sued the advertising agencies. Um, and so I think that's a great example that we're using lots of copyrighted work already on the web, but maybe we're not aware of how we're using it and we're not aware of the risks involved of using with using it. Now, if you post a meme to your Facebook page, is someone going to come and sue you for doing it? Probably not. But I think it's really important for us to recognize that under the current copyright law, there's really not a lot of difference. I mean, between that and putting it in an advertisement, uh, it really just comes down to what the owner of that of that work uh, wants to, um, what, what legal action they might want to follow or, or not follow. So this leads to a rethinking of copyright, um, both in the form of copyleft and creative commons. Creative commons was, was created by, the, um, by a nonprofit group to help us to rethink copyright, to help us to think about how can we share our work in a way that is usable to others so that they don't have to worry about me coming along later on and suing them for using my work the way that I wanted them to do it. Because most people, when they put stuff online, they do so with the intent of someone 
of someone else sharing, uh, using it and sharing it. So we'll talk more about Creative Commons later, but Creative Commons is a way to rethink copyright or a way for authors to release their copyrighted work to the public in a way that allows for freedom of reuse and redistribution. Now with all of these concepts, I hope that we as educators can begin to think of ourselves as digital DJs, as those who can remix digital content in ways that are legal and ethical and understand the implications of doing so, um, but and also um, not fall victim to uh, the fears associated with copyright that are um, frankly archaic and that um, are in the process of changing or should be in the process of changing. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, open textbooks are one way of doing this, um, but I think it extends far beyond that. We can think about using open resources in a variety of other ways that are not limited to, uh, to the textbook format. Um, in this regard, one of the things that we did here in the state of Idaho this summer, the summer of 2014, was we brought together uh, four groups of K-12 educators. We had two elementary groups and two high school groups. Each group had about 30 educators. And with each group of 30, we broke them up into additional five groups. So five, we had about five groups of six. Um, uh, so 120 educators all together. And we talked to them about copyright. We talked to them about Creative Commons. We taught them how to find resources and to know what the copyright status was and to understand how they can reuse um, reuse, remix, redistribute uh, Creative Commons and copyleft works in their own educational resources for the purpose of creating textbooks for their school districts or lesson plans that they can share freely online and so forth. And as we did that, um, it was shocking to me to see just um, how, how eager educators were to, to, to do that. Um, educators want to share, I right? think. Generally speaking, educators uh, enter the profession because they care about other people and they want to help other people. And um, that includes students and that also includes other educators. So when one educator creates a lesson plan, they typically want to share that with other educators. The big question is, how do I share that in a way that ensures that um, my intellectual property is, is respected in the way that I want it to be respected? And how do I... Um, how, how do things like fair use play into that? Because lots of educators use fair use copyrighted materials in their classes without necessarily understanding how they can uh, then reshare those works out. Um, one of the interesting things that emerged out of this institute was there were there a number of misconceptions or false assumptions about issues of copyright, fair use, and public domain. So when, when educators came to these institutes, we had them take a pre-survey where they self-evaluated on each of these areas. And then we had them do a post-survey as well, where they both self-evaluated where they were at at the end of the three-day institute, but also upon reflection, where they think they really were at at the beginning. So you had them self-evaluating at the beginning and then self-evaluating at the end regarding where they, they recognized that they were really at at the beginning. And one of the things that we found was that in issues of copyright, fair use, public domain, and open education, educators all rated themselves higher at the beginning than they did at the end, meaning that at the end, they, as they learned more about copyright and as they learned more about fair use, they recognized that they had some false assumptions coming in. They thought they knew more than they actually did. The same, the same pattern was not followed by other topics that we really didn't talk about in the Institute, things like Common Core or Copyleft. Um, well, actually, so things like Common Core. Copyleft was a different issue because um, virtually everyone coming in had never heard of Copyleft before. And so as they um, went through the Institute, they weren't operating under false assumptions because they didn't, they didn't have any assumptions to operate under. But I think this is really important because if educators already believe that they understand copyright and already believe that they understand fair use, then this creates a situation where they don't recognize the need to learn more about open education. And they think that they're operating um, in an optimal place when they're actually not. One of the other interesting things that emerged from this institute is um, that we, we gathered evidence showing that 
Um, one of the assumptions that we have about educational technology is patently false. Oftentimes I've heard um, technology integration specialists and those involved in technology integration talk about um, older or more experienced uh, teachers as not being as innovative as younger teachers. The assumption is that as teachers stay in the classroom as they you know, work for five years or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, they become jaded and they no longer want to innovate. Well, and I don't know that that's true. And actually, um, there is theoretical evidence showing that, well, there's evidence showing that that's not the case. And the evidence that we found from the Institute was that it didn't matter uh, how long teachers had been working in the classrooms. They were all just as eager to learn. They all uh, learned just as much through the Institute and they were all just as willing to change. Um, the big difference, I think, between younger educators and more experienced educators is that more experienced educators have an easier time of recognizing garbage. And for that reason, if we're trying to get them to go along with some new great innovation that really isn't all that innovative, then no, they're not going to they're not going to get on board. But for open education, I thought this was exciting because um, we saw that it didn't matter across the board. And so that speaks tells me that um, that open education is truly innovative and that it appeals to all educators, not just the young educators and not just the more experienced educators. So to sum up, I am really excited about, about open education. So is Chuck Norris, apparently. Um, but open education provides lots of exciting opportunities for, it to, for us to address uh, some of the persistent problems uh, in K-12, specifically surrounding cost and access and flexibility and reuse of educational resources. So that was my introduction uh, to open education and to this course. I hope that um, I was able to answer some of the questions that you may have had. Um, if you have additional questions, feel free to email me or to uh, put them in the back channel or in any of the other, excuse me, through any of the other methods that, that I've mentioned. Um, I'm very excited to be going through this experience with you and learning with you. Um, open education is a very exciting opportunity for us to collaborate together as educators and to bring lots of people around the table. Um, I, um, I hope that through the design of this course and how I'm teaching this course that I can um, give you an example of what it might be like to be an open educator and to um, get excited about what the, op what the possibilities are. Um, just to answer a question that just came in, uh, Bonnie asks, can we share this video with people in our building even if they are not signed up for the course? Yes, absolutely, please do. Um, as I stop this broadcast, when it goes off of live, it will then be archived on YouTube and I'll send out the link to that on YouTube. So as long as they have access to YouTube, they'll be able to watch it. Um, also, they're welcome to sign up for the course. This, the enrollment doesn't close because everything is open and everything is available online, um, anyone can come on at any time and go through the course. Um, ideally, we'd like everyone to go through at the same pace just so that we're learning together and uh, having conversations together. But if someone decides a week from now or two weeks from now that they really want to participate, they can jump right in and they can come do it as well. Uh, so all again, all the resources associated with this course are open, they're available, anyone can use them. Um, you'll notice at the bottom of the web page, um, there is a, it's a CC BY license, which we'll talk about later, but it basically just means that if you wanted to use these materials in your own trainings at your own school, you could do that as well. Um, and again, all the videos will be available. So that's all the questions that I see coming through right now. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this broadcast and thank you for watching. Um, I will send out an email to all those who have signed up for the course so that you can watch that you can have the video available to you um, hereafter. And so thank you for, for tuning in and I'm excited to learn with you. Thank you. Goodbye.